Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks to the speakers this morning for a great introduction. Um, thank you all for being settled. Um, I'm sorry if I'm a little congested. I'm just getting over being quite sick. Um, so I'll try to make it through the talk without sneezing all over everybody. Um, <clears throat> My name is Laura Frank. I'm the director of engineering at CodeChip. CodeChip is a CI CD company, so a hosted kind of software solution cloud based CI CD company. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about CI really or CD today, but if you want to talk about CI and CD later, I'll be around all day, so please get in touch with me. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, unlike the talk earlier, um, which was kind of about DevOps in general, we're going to take a really deep dive into some of the tooling that helps you release your software faster. And specifically, I'm going to talk to you about orchestration um, and container orchestration tooling today. Um, I've been involved with Docker for quite a long time. Um, I think I started using Docker in production um, well, well before 1.0 with version 0.7 or something um, in 2013, kind of right in its infancy. And I've been doing a lot of um, speaking and training, blog posts, uh, et cetera, about Docker. Um, and I have been awarded the, the great title of Docker Captain, which is a distinction for community leaders. So if you're brand new to containers, or maybe you're just learning about Docker, please talk to me as well. Um, I'd love to talk to you about getting started specifically with Docker. I am also mentioned CodeShip, because um, I work for them. <laughs> so I lead that engineering team there to, um, on the infrastructure side. Today we're going to talk about um, specific things about orchestration tools. So we're going to talk about managing distributed state with uh, the Raft consensus algorithm. So things like quorum, leader election, log replication, all of these things that are um, kind of a little bit deeper inside of your container orchestration tool, but really important, especially during an incident, for you to understand these very fundamental concepts to container orchestration. Um, I'll also touch on service scheduling, so how do jobs and tasks get scheduled on nodes? How does your container orchestrator know how to run um, what it is you've asked it to run? And then we'll go over some failure recovery scenarios, so what happens maybe when you lose a manager node or if you, um, your data center kind of starts on fire or there's a network partition, a lot of um, fa uh, failure scenarios, we'll talk about recovering from them. Throughout the talk, I'll have a couple live demos. Um, I have some recorded demos just in case the Wi-Fi fails, and then also some debugging tips. So there's going to be some times when I just kind of have a slide to introduce the concept, but don't go into a lot of detail on it. My slides are online um, and really meant for you as a resource so that later, if you're interested in digging deeper into some of the topics I cover, you have the option to do that on your own. Um, throughout the talk, I want to just give a shout out to one really cool project, and uh, actually there are three open source projects. I'm going to use this tool called playwithdocker.com. It's where if you're new to containers or you just want to like um, play around with something without having to set up a Docker host, you can just do it right in the browser. You can start nodes, um, join them to a cluster, so you can have kind of the Docker Swarm distributed cluster. Um, you can also do the same thing with Kubernetes via Play with Kubernetes. And if those of you that know about the Mobi project, um, it's a set of kind of independent um, build kits that help you maybe build a new OS or build um, something that can enable you to um, run containerized workloads. You can also play with the Mobi project in the browser. Um, these are uh, other projects by Docker Captains, I'm going to showcase Play with Docker for all of my live demos. Feel free to check it out on your own. Uh, so before we get into a lot of the implementation detail, I think it's important to take a bit of time to think about um, why we use container orchestration systems to begin with. And um, kind of the real meat of the problem is that these container orchestration tools, or really any kind of distributed application management tool, is trying to get a bunch of computers to behave like one computer. Um, and much like humans, um, it's kind of difficult to kind of wrangle them, and it, it presents problems of its own. So there's kind of two main problem sets. How does the system maintain a state? If you perform one action against node one, how does node three or five know um, what the state is? And then if you ask for 10 replicas of some service, how does the container management system know how to schedule um, that work and which nodes are eligible to take on those workloads? 
I'm gonna do um, some demos and explain some things for sort of debugging purposes to showcase some of the underlying fundamentals. Um, most notably, I'm gonna run work on manager nodes, and I have to give this disclaimer before I start the talk because um, some people have then gone home and run work on manager nodes, and it's been a bit disastrous, so um, a lot of what I'm doing for the live demos and kind of like breaking stuff intentionally is for educational purposes only. So please don't use this like cowboy mentality in production and break your stuff um, and then be mad at me for it. So um, just have to, to state this is for educational purposes only. Um, to give us a kind of graphical representation of what we'll be talking about today, um, this is when we talk about container management tools, container orchestration tools, this is sort of the landscape that we're operating against um, regardless of if you're using Kubernetes or um, Docker or any other orchestration tool, um, you'll have some set of manager nodes, usually an odd number, and I'll get into that a bit later, and then you'll have some set of worker nodes. For this talk, I'm really only going to talk about these blue nodes, which are the manager nodes, because that's where kind of all the decisions are made. The workers are just dumb nodes, they're just executing work. The managers are actually managing state. Um, deciding the scheduling problems, reconciling state, et cetera. Um, and that's where kind of all the fun stuff happens. One of the very fundamental concepts of operating um, and using container orchestration uh, tools is this concept of quorum. And when you are operating a cluster, administrating a cluster, responding to an incident on a cluster, quorum is probably one of the very first things that you'll have contact with because it influences a lot of the decisions you make about how big your cluster should be. Um, this idea of quorum isn't unique to container orchestration systems. It's just a general term, and it, it means the minimum number of votes that a group needs in order to be able to agree on something. And in the case of container orchestration systems, this means how many managers need to be online and voting um, to agree on some action. So that action could be restarting a down container. That action could be scaling up replicas. Um, if you do not have quorum, so if you don't have enough managers online, if there's a system outage, um, it just means that no new work can be performed. Your system comes to a deadlock. And oftentimes when things aren't behaving as expected in your Kubernetes cluster and your Swarm cluster, it's because you've lost quorum and you need to perform some action to reconcile your management group so that quorum can come back, those managers can vote, and um, your system can kind of recover or maintain uh, the operations as you expect. Quorum is a bit complicated, um, and it can be kind of a head uh, scratcher at first, but luckily it's a problem that can be solved easily with math. So if you're wondering, like, given my manager group, what is quorum, there is a simple formula, which is n divided by 2 plus 1. Um, so in other words, more than 50% is quorum for any number of managers. Um, so if you have a manager group of 1, obviously you need one manager online to have quorum. If you have two, you need both of them online to have quorum because one is only 50%, you need two to be over 50%. Um, and we can kind of extrapolate this and fill in a graph. I think what's more important maybe than talking about the quorum number is talking about the fault tolerance number because that's what you really care about. You wanna know how many manager nodes can, can go down before your system can stop performing new work. Um, and you'll notice a pattern here that it's kind of duplicated, like 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2. Um, and that adding another manager, so like an, an even number of managers, actually doesn't give you any more fault tolerance. Uh, and this is kind of like a, kind of a mind-blowing moment, maybe if you're new to this concept of quorum or container orchestrators. So you may instinctually think, oh, well, two managers is obviously better than one. Um, but what you're actually doing when you have these even numbers of managers is you're kind of increasing your chance of losing quorum. So in the case of going from one manager to two managers, um, there's both a fault tolerance of zero for both of those. So by having two managers, you're actually doubling um, your chance of losing quorum because you have two points of failure instead of just one. Um, if you are doing like a side project, I think one manager is totally fine. Um, if you're kind of operating a smallish application using Kubernetes or Swarm, you might have a manager group of three. I tend to advise people that if what you're doing is making money for your company, that five would be the recommended number um, because you have a fault tolerance of two in that case, which means you can be updating one manager and then tolerate still a failure of the other manager. Um, that's my kind of rule of thumb of what I recommend. Um, when placing managers or deciding how big your management group should be, you definitely want to pay attention to data center topology. Um, so whether it's multi-region or multi-AZ, which is probably more common, um, especially if you're using like AWS in US East now, I think there's 
seven AZs or six AZs, you want to make sure that you are purposely um, placing your managers to anticipate one of those data centers, those like availability zones, is going to go offline or somehow have an outage. Um, so there are some distribution recommendations. So if you have three managers, maybe you place one in each. If you have five and you're distributing across three availability zones, uh, maybe one, two, and two. That way, if one of them goes down, you still maintain your quorum. Um, this is, of course, just a kind of loose set of recommendations. I'm sure there's other recommendations out there, but I found this, this pattern to be pretty successful in production um, for applications that I've worked on or, or helped consult on. Um, if you're using a tool like Docker for AWS or like container orchestration tool for some cloud platform, this is usually done for you automatically. So one example is Docker for AWS. If you're standing up Docker Swarm cluster on AWS using the tool Docker for AWS, um, this is more or less done with you, uh, done for you through their tool configurations. It's pretty simple, which is really nice. Um, let's talk a little bit deeper about this idea of Quorum and what it's used for. Um, and the reason that we care about Quorum is that uh, your container orchestration system is maintaining state using this algorithm called the Raft Consensus Algorithm. Um, if you are brand new to container orchestration, or even if you've been operating it for quite a long time, you may na not have any idea um, about this algorithm or ever read any of the academic papers about it or looked at the implementation. And that's kind of on purpose. It's meant to be sort of invisible to you. I think that having a deeper understand, understanding of it can help kind of um, help you make better decisions, which is why I think it's worth going into it a bit now. Um, Raft is really popular because writing a distributed consensus algorithm is really, really complicated, and no sensible person would try to write it themselves. Um, and if you are trying to write it yourself, I commend you, but I probably wouldn't use it in production. <laughs> um, so Raft is responsible for a couple things. It, again, it's very popular. So it's responsible for log replication, so maintaining state across a distributed system. It's responsible for leader election. Um, in a management group, there's always one leader who's kind of taking in requests and forwarding them out to the followers um, and, and making sure that the kind of work is being distributed in the right way and that everyone is um, more or less in agreement about the state of the, the system. There's also this other um, third uh, function that's called safety. And I'm not going to talk about this much today um, because it's not as exciting as, as log replication or leader election. But in short, safety just means that Raft is making sure that no action that shouldn't take place takes place. So it's just making sure that um, like, the things that are happening are meant to happen and they should be happening. Um, that kind of relates back to log replication and leader election. If you're interested in learning more about that, um, I would encourage you to check out one of the many um, great blog posts or even the academic, academic paper. It was someone's PhD thesis. Um, you can read that paper. It's really interesting. Um, Raft, so as I said, it's very popular. Um, and it was someone's thesis, in, or sorry, their dissertation. And it was designed to be a bit easier to understand. So if you studied um, CS, and you had to deal with like Paxos or multi-Paxos or some of the older consensus algorithms, they are like really fun for your computer science professor to torture you with. Like I felt very tortured when I had to learn um, those algorithms because they're very hard to reason about. Raft was designed to be easier to understand, um, which is really great for you as operators or people who are using container orchestration systems because it just makes things a little bit more um, accessible and easier to reason about for you. I mentioned, um, of course, Docker, and I mentioned like maybe you're using uh, Raft and you didn't know about it. And, and chances are, if you so if you're using Kubernetes or if you've ever used Kubernetes, uh, Mesosphere, any of the tools that rely on parts of Kubernetes or Docker, you're already using Raft and you just don't know about it. Um, etcd is a really popular kind of distributed key value store that's often used for state management and orchestration tools. Um, etcd implements Raft. So they have a really great Raft implementation. So if you're using any tool that relies on etcd, which is a core OS project, um, you're already using Raft, and you're kind of already being affected by some of the choices and, and the behaviors of this algorithm. 
The difference about Docker Swarm versus Kubernetes, if we want to like call out some differences, is that Swarm, um, which is based on this uh, Mobi project component called SwarmKit, um, it's part of Docker. Docker implements the Raft algorithm directly. So Docker doesn't use etcd for its Raft. It uses just an internal built-in uh, implementation of Raft. So that's kind of operationally a bit simpler. You don't have to stand up etcd. Um, it has some other advantages, maybe some disadvantages about everything kind of being baked in uh, to one thing. But that's a main difference is kind of where Raft is happening. With Docker, it's happening directly in Docker. Um, with Kubernetes and other orchestration tools, it's usually happening in some external service like etcd. Um, one thing I'll call out, um, and I sort of mentioned this at the beginning about um, not running work on your manager nodes, and that's because your manager nodes are participating in this Raft consensus group. Um, they're giving heartbeats to like one another and checking on the workers. They're replicating logs. They're doing a lot of work, um, and they're particularly sensitive to resource starvation, meaning it's probably not a good idea to run actual work on those nodes because they're too busy doing other like manager stuff. Um, and what you don't want to happen is that your manager nodes like become overloaded and then go down because then you lose quorum and then your system comes to a deadlock. Um, in Docker, the command to um, drain work from the node is via Docker node update. I think every container orchestration tool has some form of a node drain, which means don't run any work on this particular node. I would highly recommend in production to use something like node drain um, or you know don't run work on your manager nodes because they're participating in this Raft consensus algorithm. Um, of course, as I said, I'm going to run work on manager nodes during this talk for educational purposes. Um, I don't recommend it for production. The two things I mentioned about uh, what Raft is really responsible for, leader election and, and log replication, we can go into um, a little bit deeper now. Um, I want to call out that managers in your management cluster have basically three different states that they can be in, um, and kind of four if you count unreachable or down. So one manager node in your cluster is going to be the leader. Um, this means that it's the one kind of taking requests in and then forwarding them to the follower. Um, follower is another state that just means it's, it's getting information from the leader, uh, but it's not the leader itself. Um, there's this kind of middle state which is called candidate. And that's what happens when a leader goes down um, and then your management group has no leader. Some follower, whichever one times out first and realizes first, like, hey, there's no leader, it will elect itself um, to become the new leader and it gets put into candidate state. Then there needs to be a vote to say, yep, cool, candidate number zero, go ahead and become the new leader, it's fine. We all agree you can be the new leader, then it will assume the position of leader um, until the next election cycle. I want to um, just take a really quick moment to go over this. Uh, I have a domain buying addiction, so I, I own consensus.group because I really love Raft. Um, there's also a really great um, kind of demo of the Raft algorithm. It's called Secret Lives of Data, and that's actually from the original author as part of his dissertation. Um, we can head over to demo.consensus.group. If you can do it on your device, or I'll just um, show it here, just to go over a really quick um, demo of like what does leader election look like. Um, so we're going to start out and let's see, maybe I can make that a little bigger. Um, we'll start out with a five manager group. And in this case, there's actually no leader elected. They're kind of all at the same, uh, they're all the same color and like none of them is called out with an, a special outline that they'll get as the leader. Um, and what you can notice is that as I start this thing, there are kind of tickers around each um, each node, and that's because Raft is working on this heartbeat um, kind of exchange. So every, the leaders are communicating with some kind of timeout or heartbeat, um, and they're all staggered. And that's how, um, during a leader election, I said the, it's the very first manager that realizes the leader is down becomes the new candidate, and that's like basically whatever heartbeat expires first um, and doesn't get a response back from the leader knows that, oh, hey, we have no leader. I'm going to put myself up for election. So in this case, S2 was the first one to time out. Um, so it's going to elect itself to become the new leader. It's going to say, hey, I'm a candidate. And it's going to ask, uh, oh, sorry, S2 goes down. Three is the one who um, realizes that, that S2, the leader, is down. It uh, asks 
for votes. Let me rewind time here a little bit. It's going to start a new leader election cycle. So we were on election two, the blue twos, and we're going to start orange three. Um, S3 says, hey, I'm going to become the new leader. It puts itself into candidate state, and then it's going to ask for a vote. And this is where the idea of quorum becomes really important, because this isn't just for leader elections. It's any kind of uh, activity in your cluster needs to go through this voting mechanism. Um, leader election is just a nice, clear example to show you kind of how the voting works. Um, because we have a five node cluster, our quorum is three, which means that one failure on S2 is totally fine. We can still get the required amount of votes um, from, from quorum in order to vote and have our managers agree that some action can take place. In this case, it's a leader election. Um, so we can see these um, green four little kind of voting dots going out and pinging all the rest of the leader, or uh, I'm sorry, all the rest of the um, nodes that are in the cluster we're not going to get a response back from S2 because it's down. Um, but that's fine because quorum is three. And we can see that these three votes are being returned. Um, and then fulfilling the, the quorum requirements, three is then elected as the new leader. If um, we had maybe three down managers, this could not happen. The scenario could not happen because we don't have quorum. And we, don't, we simply don't have enough votes to satisfy the quorum requirements to vote on something to allow it to take place. Our system would be in a total deadlock. Um, no new action could take place. There couldn't be a new leader election. And you would have to manually intervene to perform some um, reconciliation on your system to bring some down nodes back up or maybe force a new cluster in order for the system to keep going. I'll go over some failure scenarios um, kind of toward the end of the talk of, of what to do um, specifically when using Docker when, when things like that happen. Um, I would recommend if you want to check out and learn more about Raft and uh, more leader election scenarios, more log replication scenarios, um, either of these two resources would be great to, to follow up on. Um, I really do love Secret Lives of Data. just doesn't demo very well in a talk, which is why I have the um, demo.consensus.group. A bit more about log replication, because um, I've mentioned it a couple times. And I think it's confusing, especially if you're not um, super familiar with container orchestration systems um, or distributed computing, kind of like old school distributed computing. In the, concept, or in the context of distributed computing, and then also in the context of this talk, this log is not like the stack trace from your application. Um, this log is an append-only kind of ledger or time-based record of data. Um, it's what's the, the source of truth for the state of your cluster. Um, it looks maybe like this. If you're imagining a log for the value of x, um, it's append only. And we have a first entry. So x at one point was 2. And then at some point, it became 10 and became 30, et cetera. Um, we will then append a new entry on to the very end of it. And this is our log, um, very simple example for the value of x. This log is not meant for human beings, really, to consume. Um, it is meant for computers. It is the way that all of your, um, that your nodes, your manager nodes can manage state and agree on state. This is a, a very small file that's then kind of replicated to all of the managers. Um, in simple systems, so if you're not in a distributed system, it's it's pretty straightforward. Like if you have a client saying, hey, can x be 7? And the server's like, cool, yeah, sure. Um, and I can append it to the log, and that's totally fine. Um, what happens during um, a distributed system, though, or during this kind of request flow in a distributed system is that we have to go through a quorum vote. Um, and that's going to be exactly the same scenario that we saw before with leader election. Instead of no, we're not going to be voting on electing a leader. We're going to be voting on whether or not x can be 7. Um, there is a log replication example and also some examples of like what happens when things get out of sync on demo.consensus.group just after the leader election stuff, if you want to check that out on your own. I think it's uh, maybe more exciting um, to look at a demo. Um, I'll do that in just a second. I, I just want to uh, make a note that, to me, distributed, um, distributed computing, distributed systems, Log replication is like the backbone and heart of so many things, and especially so many things that can go wrong. Um, there is a really great blog post by one of the engineers at LinkedIn about um, distributed logs and um, log replication, why it's important, what kind of systems you send, because it's certainly not just distributed systems. 
Um, I have a handy link, bit.ly slash logging post. So if you want to check out that post, I highly recommend reading it. Um, to me, it's been one of the most kind of valuable blog posts that I've come across in, in recent months. Um, so again, I'm going to demo some things on the Docker Playground. Um, let's just make sure that I have a terminal here. So what I'm going to show you is what log replication looks like, or kind of just like prove that it's happening. So I have a three node cluster, and apologies to those of you in the back who are, uh, it's maybe a bit hard to see this. I have some examples that are a bit easier to see. Um, this is kind of a, a prototype tool, but I think it's, it's really valuable to demo with it. Um, I have a three node cluster, so over here on the sidebar I have node one, two, and three. Um, I also have this visualizer hooked up so that we can kind of visually see what it is that I'm running. Um, you can see I have node one, node two, node three, they're all green. They're online participating in a management group. They're all managers. Um, and then we have some application running on them. Um, and we can see every container that's running on these. So I have um, this voting application, which if you've ever attended a DockerCon or watched a live stream of a DockerCon, this is what, um, what you'll see. So it's a simple cat versus dog voting app. Um, I have this running on a distributed cluster of three managers. Um, cool, dogs are way better than cats. I did see some cats outside though, which was, was pretty nice. Um, what I want to show is uh, we can set up like a, an inotify wait on the, the directory that's storing the logs. Um, and we can watch like performing an action on node one, and then we can actually see and verify that the log is being replicated to node three. Um, without us having to do anything. It's just sort of the system working as expected. So um, I'm just mounting in the directory. Um, if you're using Docker, all of the raft logs, uh, again, raft is embedded inside Docker directly. They're just living in var lib docker swarm raft. Um, they're just like right there. Um, you can dump them if you want to. Um, there's some tools to dump them and see them. Right now, I'm just going to set up a simple watch on that directory um, because I just want to show I'm on node three right now. Um, and I'm going to perform some action on node one. I'm going to scale a uh, service, maybe vote, uh, maybe the front end. I'm going to scale it to three, maybe. Um, and I can see that I got confirmation on node one that my service was scaled to three. Um, and as I expected, I can see the log replication actually happening. Um, and I can see that it's um, these, these files, this append only log um, in my raft directory are being modified um, as soon as I perform that action. So this is um, kind of log replication in action. This is where it's happening on your system. If you ever run into um, a scenario where you really need to know what's going on inside of this, um, this log file, Swarm at least has a tool that you can dump it. Um, it's right in the Swarm kit um, tool. I'll mention it on a slide a little later. Um, it's maybe not the most useful thing to look at unless you're like really, really um, stuck on something or during an incident and you need to like look out specific things like election terms um, IP addresses of manager nodes, et cetera. Um, but what I think is really cool is watching the log replication happen embedded in Swarm. It's, it's super powerful um, and, a, and I think a really cool way of doing container orchestration. Cool. Um, here's the, the utility that I mentioned, um, Docker Swarm Kit. In the CMD directory, there's this tool called Swarm Raft Tool. There's also instructions in the readme if you want to dump your raft logs and look at things like election terms, IP addresses of managers, any action that's been per performed on your swarm. Um, one other thing to note is that if you run into, um, like, <laughs> you might want to back up this directory because it's embedded, like, because you have the, the log and that's the state and, like, the, the state of everything, you can restore your cluster just simply by providing it that log. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but um, kind of a, a pro tip if you're starting to use this in production is that I would highly recommend, specifically if you're using Docker, to do some offsite backup of that, um, 
that raft log in var lib docker swarm raft, I would just back up the whole directory. Cool, a couple uh, notes about scheduling. So if you did study CS or if you're familiar with a lot of scheduling algorithms, like um, we have spread, random, bin pack, a bunch of other ones, um, these scheduling al algorithms are meant to schedule or meant to solve problems that like um, if you order something from Amazon and you're trying to pack as much crap in a single box um, and ship it to someone most as, as efficiently as possible. Those are the kinds of problems that, that algorithms like bin pack are trying to solve. Highly available applications and making sure your application stays online. Um, that's kind of a different problem. So orchestrators have to use some kind of specialized scheduling algorithms in order to solve the problem set that's sort of at the intersection of scheduling problems and highly available application problems. Um, bin pack might not be the most ideal uh, scheduling uh, algorithm, so if you're not familiar with bin pack, that's like the one where you shove as much crap into a single place. Um, so putting as many containers on a single node as there are capacity. It's a great way to save money, but you've still created a single point of failure. Um, if we're talking about high availability, that's probably not the best scenario um, for your application, because if that node goes down, you're kind of losing um, all of your system at once. There are um, a couple different ways that many different orchestration tools handle this. I think. Um, you can choose, in general, um, you can choose kind of the scheduling um, approach or, or algorithm that you're using, and you can generally find that in the docs. Docker is one that does not let you choose, simply because the um, engineers at Docker have spent lots of time fine-tuning a very specific, highly available application scheduling algorithm that's service-aware, so it will never place, um, like, the same service, two replicas of the same service on the sa same node if it can avoid it. Um, even if that node is the one that's most eligible or has the most resources. So that, that's something that's um, really cool about the scheduling algorithm in Docker. A couple things to call out are uh, scheduling constraints. This is again a universal pattern across orchestrators. So um, if you can attach a, a label to your nodes, maybe you want to label based on region, maybe you want to label uh, based on like, hey, use this for Databases use this for API, use this for web UI. You can add constraints to your system that say, please schedule this type of work on this type of node um, via scheduling constraints. This can also work, especially in Docker, for running uh, Linux and Windows side by side. So you can have a Docker swarm that's comprised of both Windows and Linux, tag the nodes as either Windows or Linux, and then run specific workloads in kind of this hybrid uh, swarm, which is super cool and, and uh, a really kind of a, a leap forward in terms of um, administering kind of legacy applications and bringing them onto containers and running with an orchestration system. One of my very favorite features um, about container uh, orchestration tools, specifically Docker, is this idea of topology-aware scheduling. Um, and this is expressed in Docker via this thing called placement preference. Um, basically what a placement preference does is that it spreads the work across um, nodes that belong to some label group. Um, for example, if you have nodes, uh, maybe a couple nodes in one data center and a couple nodes in the other data center, you can ask Docker to spread the work out like um, really evenly across all of those, uh, those data centers. This is a very kind of loose and suggested uh, constraint, so it's not a hard constraint like dash dash constraint, it's sort of like a soft preference saying like, hey, if you can, please schedule it this way. Um, but if it's not able to schedule it this way, that work will still be scheduled, maybe just not in the way that you've asked for, for placement prep. Um, one thing to call out is that Swarm um, and many orchestration tools do not rebalance healthy tasks when a new node comes online. So if you're in the middle of an incident and one of your nodes goes offline and those um, jobs are rescheduled somewhere else, uh, and maybe those new nodes, or the nodes that are still online become slightly overloaded, um, maybe they're not performing as well, and you bring a new node online, do not expect that if those containers are still running, that that new node is gonna be populated with new containers. Um, in kind of the state of the world for an orchestration system, if a container is running, there's no reason to forcefully stop it and reschedule it somewhere else. Um, it will wait for some failure to happen before moving that over uh, 
somewhere else. So I can show a quick, uh, a quick demo of this. I think just by, this is the cool thing about Play With Docker is that I can like just delete <laughs> one of the nodes and then in the visualizer we should see all of the, the work that was scheduled. I just deleted node three. Um, it just takes a, a little bit for the visualizer to catch up um, and we can see that like node three is offline. Um, all of the work got rescheduled and it's starting up and that's, that's super great. Um, I can maybe then add, like, uh, add a new instance. I'm gonna maybe just add it as a, a worker. Um, I'm gonna do that via Docker Swarm join token. Uh, we'll add it as a manager, why not? I'm gonna copy and paste the Swarm token to allow my new node to join. Um, Let me just remove the old one. Oops. Oh, that's fine. I can add this and hopefully it will um, show up in my visualizer. Um, cool, it's gonna come back online and we'll see that the, the visualizer is a little imprecise. But we can see now we have three nodes back online, but that these two nodes that have kind of a lot of work running on them, we're not gonna shut down containers that are healthy and move them over onto, onto node three. Um, but I can guess that if I were to scale up a service again, um, that we can see that new work will be scheduled on the new node. Um, so this is sort of about like understanding the behavior of the system. Um, it doesn't make sense to shut down containers that are healthy, but new work will be scheduled on the new node that comes online. That's something that tripped me up when I was sort of getting started or responding to incidents with container orchestration tools. So um, learn from my mistakes and hopefully it will be less painful for you. Um, one pro tip or debugging tip is that if you are really having trouble with um, specifically Swarm, one of my recommendations would be to add an extra manager to the management cluster, put availability drain on it so that it's not running any work, and then you can modify the Docker daemon to run in debug mode. Um, you'll, there's a little file that you can say debug equals true in the daemon.json, I think it's still called, um, and then restart Docker, and that will run it in full debug mode. That way you kind of have a closer look inside of your management cluster, maybe without having to, to read through the, the raft logs. Um, let's blow some stuff up. This is my favorite part of the talk. Um, just to find my last thing to, to end with. Um, so let's talk about a soft failure. Um, this is when you lose quorum. So things are still operating. Um, again, losing quorum doesn't mean anything that your current, like, your current application is gonna be unavailable necessarily. It just means that no new action can take place. So you have to decide what that means for your application. Um, if you're just running a web app, that's probably fine. Um, if you're running something transactional, it's probably a big deal that no new action can take place because new containers can't be brought online and do work. Um, if you have, uh, specifically, again, a, a Docker detail, if you lose quorum, you can force a new cluster on a healthy manager. Um, and I will show you that um, just very quickly here. So we have node one um, that's running this visualizer, so I'll keep this one around, but let's kind of kill uh, node two and let's kill node three. So again, I have three, manager, three managers in my cluster. That means quorum is two. I have unfortunately just lost quorum. Um, I've killed those two. Um, Let's see, it takes a little bit of time um, for this to catch up. We can look, um, I can't even look at the state of my cluster because getting the status of a cluster requires a quorum vote. It requires, like state is managed by um, all of the, the managers voting and agreeing on something. So because we have no quorum, we can't actually verify what the state is. We can observe it. Um, but we can't record it. So in this case, we can observe that um, I only have one node online. Oh, I, crap, I totally killed the wrong one. I do that all the time. Um, regardless, we can still force a new cluster. That's the important part. Um, Docker Swarm init, 
uh, I'm going to advertise one address. Um, this is just important when you're working with join tokens. But I'm going to use this handy little flag called force new cluster. This is going to say, this is a healthy manager. Take the state that you know about and just forget about all the other managers and force a new cluster on this particular one. Um, and we successfully created a new cluster. We forced a new cluster with the current manager. Um, we can look at the nodes now and get, um, oh, sorry, Docker node LS. And we can get state for the nodes. We don't get the error that we've run, uh, like we've lost quorum. And because the log was replicated, we can actually see, like we still have node one, node two. We have all of the, the records from the previous state of the cluster um, because it was in that raft log. Still here, even though we've like, disregarded the old managers that were offline and forced a new cluster to happen with this healthy manager. Um, that's one way to recover from uh, lost quorum. Of course, if you can bring the old nodes back online, that's like the first plan of attack. But oftentimes, you're not able to do that. Every single orchestration system will have its version of this force new cluster, but that's one technique to use when you do lose quorum. Um, the final thought, if your data center is on fire, uh, make sure that you have a backup of that raft log. Um, the important thing is that you want to stop your orchestration service, so in this case Docker, repopulate the log, and then start the service just to avoid conflict if you can. Of course, if like things are really crappy, maybe you don't do, you can't do that or you don't have access to do that, you can simply just um, copy that file back into where um, your service is expecting it. Um, be careful about IP addresses. Um, it's kind of an in-depth technical detail. If you find yourself in this situation, um, talk to me afterward. I'll be happy to, to give you a little bit more uh, depth about failure recovery. If you're using Swarm, here's the link to the docs. It's their super excellent documentation for uh, people who are administering Swarm. Um, that's all from me. Thank you very much. I'll hang out during the coffee break to take questions. Um, I, I don't like to do whole room questions just because they tend to be very specific. Um, so thank you very much, and please find me if you'd like to chat about CICD or Docker afterward.